Yes, everybody, you know what time it is. It's your boys Jack and Dave here, joined by Flav Bateman from the Fighting Cock Podcast. And it feels like, Flav, you know, we check in with you once a year, almost like a relative or like a cousin, you know, of some sort. And every time it's been doom and gloom, but it feels like this time it's a slightly different, more positive news. So how do you feel in your sort of Spurs world? How's your year been? How long ago was it? When? How long? Oh, like well over a year ago. I think it was around this time Conte, last year. Yeah, it was Conte. I think just Bloody got hell. sacked or was days away from getting sacked this time oh, last well, year. Uh, well, yeah, it's like a different football club now. <laughs> um, yeah, it's night and day. I think towards the end of last season, after Conte got sacked, I think we were all in a situation, a, a place where it there was a numbness that set in that you just mm. you just couldn't. He, he couldn't see where or how the club were going to turn this around. Or obviously, they were always going to be able to because Daniel Levy has the experience. But we've also the size of the football club means that you'll never be out of the picture for too long. But it felt like a massive task ahead. You know, we didn't have uh, we had our director of football who who's just been you know was banned from world football, which mm-hmm. in a way was the worst thing that could have happened because at the time. My my feeling was that that was the worst thing that could have happened to us mm. because no matter how bad Conte was was and you know whatever the temporary decisions were to you know how of how to run Tottenham yet Paratici there he was feels like he was always going to make the correct choices except mm. when you know doing things legally um, and you know it's in, as it turns out he's always he's been sort of you know operating to some degree no one seems to really know what he's doing but he's around isn't he somewhere to some extent um but anyway look, the, the, the we we lost him Conte had gone we were shipping goals we had the Newcastle game followed by a Liverpool game which actually had a spirited fight back in the end but the, the first part of the, that those that that Liverpool game I just felt nothing um yeah. Yeah. you know and all of that was compounded by what was going on down the end down the road and how well Arsenal were doing and um, it felt bad. It felt yeah. about as bad as it ever had done. And you're thinking, well, Dan, does Daniel Levy really know what he's doing? Is it everything that's going to be back in in his court to make footballing decisions? Yeah. Um, and luckily, he made the right one in Postacoglu because before we'd even kicked the ball, I felt um, immensely satisfied by his 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 um mm. his signing, and you know it's the way he conducts himself and the way he he um. All this, I'm not. I'm, I'm preaching to a choir. Here, I hope that you know. The, yeah, I mean, just and, and anyone watching is that everybody knows what how he's transformed us and what we are now is mm. is, is a million miles from where we were when th- that game against Southampton when we we lost mm. two goals in the last 15 minutes to draw three all and Conte imploded. Mm. You know, it's a different football club now, and 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 I'd really at times this season have been really frustrated by some of the reaction to Postecoglou's football. Same here. I'm like, what? What is it? Like, people are critical. Eh? We're giving too many goals away. Being naive. It's, it's, this is the start of a journey. Look where we were. Like, we were shipping goals last year, left, right, and center. Because it was in a defense, low block. It was like, oh well, you know, it, there was there was an excuse for it. Whereas Prostokoglu is is literally trying to grab the game, whoever we play, by its throat and say mm. this is this game will be played how we want it to be played. There will be times when it doesn't work. It's in those moments we have to hold fast and look at the positives and just there are some people out there just can't do it just cannot look at what's going on at Spurs without being critical about something and Mm. you just you just realize that they're just not worth your time you're not worth thinking of they're not you're not not worth listening to Mm. um but you end up also being in a position where you're fiercely defensive about possible to the point where yeah you're not even saying things you believe. Like I'm, I've been, I've defended Postacoglu and said things and defended him in a way I didn't have to be as staunchly backing of Postacoglu. Right? There are issues with the way we're playing. We are a little bit too open at times. It is ha- heart in the mouth football. You accept all of that, but mm. you, you're not arguing with these people about what the failings are. You're arguing with them because they just seem to be just want to dwell in this pool of negativity, regardless of what is going on at the football club. Crazy. Would you would you agree, um, Flav, that you know the frustration comes because we haven't won something in such a long time? Maybe if we did have an FA Cup or a League Cup or something like that, maybe a bit recently, that you know people would actually give this project more of a chance on the Ranch Postecoglou. Because I feel, you know, 
I feel, I feel that's where maybe the frustration comes from because we don't have that trophy in the bag. We don't have that success behind us. And, you know, any new manager, any new project we go into, you know, and I'm guilty of it at times myself. You know, sometimes you're not as quick to give it an opportunity or sort of jump at the first signs of, of trouble because, you know, you've sort of been down that road many times. But I think many yeah. people waiting for the club maybe to win something what's, and that has probably pulled them out of that. So any of that got to do with Pastor Coglu? Like it, yeah, all right. I, I, we're all frustrated that we haven't won thing, won anything. And out of mm. all the the big clubs, we're clearly the ones, the outliers in that we, we find the inability mm. to win trophies. But we're at the start of this journey with mm. with Postel Coglu. So let put those frustrations where they need to be, which is aligned with Daniel Levy. If you want, if you if you have to be frustrated about someone, or make comment about them, mm. Daniel Levy is the one that's overseen the twenty years of effective failure, mm. but relative to or at least um it has to be balanced by the progress that the football club's made mm. outside of winning trophies. Yeah. Uh the yeah so but aim, aim it at him possibly just let possibly get on with his job but while we're playing fantastic football yeah all right you're frustrated that we haven't won anything but let him just exist for a bit He's not Without, responsible um, for past failures. Like he, like past yeah. failures are not his responsibility. He's come in That's here to opinion, write. Yeah. He's come in here to write the ship. And mm. I think he's done enough in this season in this course of time to justify that he is the right guy to be. What did you? What did? What was? What would be like the bare minimum at the start of the season, Jack? I thought probably the bare minimum was originally to unite the fan base, and it felt like he'd done that before ball was even kicked. Like you had Good. said, that was the most impressive thing. Was everybody did seem to sort of believe in Postacoglu, mm. believe Good that football. Good football. It's a clean slate. Let's just you know forget about the past, and we have a long journey ahead of us. Let's start singing "Kumbaya" and try to get together again. Mm. And it felt like he had achieved that quite quickly. And all of a sudden, yeah, it feels like six months, seven months later. I think the original expectations were actually shattered so hard by Postecoglou mm. because he had united the fan base, delivered really exciting football, won the you know pretty much was the best team in the first ten games of the mm. season, was pretty much delivering everything so quickly. That I think everybody just then built new expectations and new that standards. That was the problem, wasn't it? And then he's guilty of being too successful and shattering the original expectations. Mm -hmm. And it's hard for ourselves to remove ourselves back to what we originally wanted. You know, we're in now hindsight, guilty. You look at that that run at the start of the season. You're like, this is. Mm. Oh, it was great, but it was almost like you said it created a false sense of where we were or where we are, and we're not. We're not there, and, and you know what? And, and at the time, he, he, you know, you said, "I let them dream. Well, let them dream about the uh, winning the league if if that's what they mm. want to think about." And then, in, like in your head, you're like, "Oh my god, maybe he thinks we can do it." Because like we <laughs> we were pissing about on the podcast, thinking like, "All right, we might let's uh, let's just dream for a bit." None of us mm. actually believed that we were going to bloody win the league. No one did. But mm. then he's sort of saying that, and going, oh, "Maybe he knows something I don't." I knew my to question, Pastor Cockley. <laughs> maybe we will win the league. Yeah, but it was, and then obviously, uh, you you forget, you forget also how much he's had to deal with this season. How much the uh, from a mm. footballing perspective, yeah. Even Conte, at what we had to deal with uh, uh, as a club, like what happened to, um, what his name now, Vetroni, the guy yeah. who passed away. Oh, yeah. Conte, yeah, a lot of his friend. friends pass away, and but Postecoglou's had a roller coaster of a season when it comes to injuries. Harry Kane leaving the very last day of the season. Yeah, you also man. look at the Asian <laughs> Cup as well as the Afcon as well happening mid season on top of the injuries. I'd say even some of the decisions that haven't gone our way, you know, when the particularly the Chelsea game really yeah. sort of rattled the whole sort of a mm. journey as well. And he's been able to steady the ship. Also, you'd say that. Originally, he had a lot of people that were praying for his downfall, I think, when he came to the Premier League. They were saying, football is not sustainable. It will eventually get found out. And those people have been just waiting and waiting and waiting for that opportunity. And uh, he really, I think, silenced them so quickly when he came to the Premier League that now like, it is this weird balance of people who have always wanted Ange to fail. And now maybe they see an opportunity to pounce on it. Or whatever, but they're forgetting, you know, how good he was in the beginning and how much he smashed everybody and almost taught everybody a lesson, really, in kind of the first ten games of this Premier League. And, yeah, and just people, a victim of his own success, I think. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And and people will say, oh, you're you're making ex excuses for him, but those are legitimate excuses for our down our downturn in form. You can just by highlighting mm -hmm. horrendously difficult situations that he's had to manage through and losing the best player that we've ever had at the football club at the start of the season. 
but and he's managed to do what he's done. Like, and if you can't look at it and go take a step back and go, do you know what? Fair play with three points mm. or whatever it is off off the Champions League place at the moment. We've got all the big teams to play. You know, it could be a great end to the season instead of choosing to look at it a different way. Is look, beyond me, really. Do you know what? Look, I. I agree with I agree with you guys, and it's actually something I've tried to say before. You know, probably just don't put it in as elegant terms as maybe you guys do. I don't have that sort of vocabulary, but like when it comes to Posta Coglu, <laughs> you know, don't get me wrong, he's benefited from the foundations that Paratici put in place before he came here, with some of the signings, the rotation of the squad he was doing, and all that sort of stuff. But Posta Coglu came in, and I think with Posta Coglu, because he wasn't a well-known name out there, he's not, you know, he didn't have the reputation that Jose or Conte came with. That all that always went against him, you know, because he's from Australia, you know, he's not from a reputable footballing country, as some people would say. That's gone against him. But the guy has turned our fortune around. What we're seeing on the pitch is a team that's committed. Last year and the years gone by, we've seen teams that would be committed for so long and completely fell off. I see a lot of every time we lose. The knives come out for Ange Posta Coglu, which I do not like. You know, I think we've got to be smarter than that in in regards of we haven't had a full manager in the dugout since Pochettino. It's not sustainable. You have to give a manager time to build. If Jurgen Klopp, if Jurgen Klopp got sacked at Liverpool after the first season, they wouldn't have gone on to have the success they did. The Guardiola at Man City when he wasn't what people were expecting when he first came. He went and spent a hundred odd million on fullbacks, rejuvenated his squad, and went on to win everything. Our t- our Arsenal, I hate saying this, this absolutely kills me because I want him to fail. I want everyone that goes to that club to fail. But if they, if the board listened to that, that the fan base putting the pressure on Arteta, they wouldn't be up there challenging for titles and stuff like that as well. So mm. for me, I think we have to look at it. And has he done enough? Has he given you what you wanted or what people wanted when they didn't want Conte, want Conte here? And if the answer is yes, then you've got to take the good with the bad. He comes out and says it in press conferences himself. He only done a, 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 a an interview a month ago where he said, I'm still not happy with this squad. You know, there's still a lot of the squad that, you know, they don't have the dynamism to get around the pitch the way I need them and stuff like that. He's openly said, I need three transfer windows to be able to create my squad. Where the games that were, some of the games we have lost and that period after the 10 games is when he's had to rely on squad players that weren't good enough under previous managers and have been here long before him. They're not his signings. They're not his sort of players. And I also think the fact that we haven't won anything, I think that's where the frustration comes in. People are very quick to rip, blow it all up and, you know, restart again. And I think any manager that comes in here will always have to deal with that. And I don't agree with it. I, I, I think, you know, put your frustrations to the owners, no problem with that. But if you can see the right team behind the manager, don't go for the manager. And to be fair, there is a lot of people that back the manager and stick behind them and still have their frustrations with the owners and stuff like that. But I would urge Spurs fans out there, we've got a good team going on now. We play good football. We play the way we want to. You're seeing a team that we're never out of the game. Even if it's 94, 95 minutes, you still feel like we're going to score a goal. And you're seeing players out there fighting for the badge, which is all we could ever ask for from players that have come in here. We're not we're not seeing players out there taking the pay packet and not giving a shit. And I do think Ange is the right man to bring this club forward. Um, I do, I do urge people, yeah. you know, give Ange the time. And if you're frustrated with, you know, past failures of the club, which a lot of us are, that has to go in a different direction from Ange Postacoglu. He's here to try and improve the situation. I think the three other times we have brought you in here, Flav, though, we have relied on you mostly for crisis management, specifically your <laughs> Tottenham crisis management. It is kind of a relief that we don't have to necessarily do that this time. We don't need to rely on your skills in that we, area. We, we do get that sometimes. And say, I, I, I think that is... I don't, it's not a conscious thing. It's just like on the podcast, and we don't always achieve it. You know, like there was a podcast that we did with Cal and Ricky, and Cal was being quite honest about how he felt about things, which is fine, right? You got to publish that sort of stuff, mm. but not everyone wanted to hear it. And 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 the fighting cock has as o- over many years consciously positioned itself as a way to try and see the the wood for the trees. Mm-hmm. Right, just to, to to try and see some some light, right? Even in mm. when things are going tits up, and I think the way we did that in the Conte era was like, well, this isn't forever, you know. One good decision, mm. and, and and we're we're in a different mm. football club, and um, but it's not it's not always easy. It's not always easy to do, mm. but 
you know, it's it's what what people people yeah. message and release a podcast. I feel miserable. I like I fucking feel miserable. I, I don't want to do a podcast right now. Well, it's been kind of a relief when making some of these questions that we uh, haven't had to you know necessarily rely on you to solve all of our problems for us yet again. Just quickly though, Moon Dog member for twenty eight months saying loving your streams from day one. Big up Dave and Jack. Really appreciate you, Moon Dog, as well as Steve D for seventeen months as a member saying afternoon guys biggest summer window in years and steve d love you and appreciate you and it actually helped me transition to while we do you know like to think that we're not going to make you suffer too much with the kind of doom and gloom uh flab we are going to still make you check in on our boy just, daniel levy yeah dave just quickly i just want to give a quick shout out to uh tech in to um uh, mark to paul o'connor uh james flower ribsy 85 as well drew zilla wayne bonner um, make sure I'm not missing um, and Steve D and that's why well. big yourselves up thank you very much for tuning in and um, we're checking in on our boy Daniel Coys here and in the beginning of this season Flav Daniel Levy said that we have our Tottenham back with less mm. than 10 games until the end of the first season under Ange do you feel like Daniel Levy went a little early with that one or do you think we in fact have our Tottenham back with less than 10 games left yeah, I mean, it's our Tottenham, right? You, you just do your job. You run, you buy the players, right? <laughs> Employ the manager, do your job, whether that be putting fucking F1 tracks in or whatever it might be. Generate the revenue, spend the money, buy the players. Like, you, you, you can't, it's not, it wasn't the right thing to say. It was the wrong time to say it. We weren't over what we experienced last season. And um, just be quiet. Like that, that, that would have been that would have been my way of doing it. You know, the, the a couple of times he has spoken, and you know, to be fair, Spurs fans have called on him to be a bit more vocal and explain what's going True. on. But every time he does, he gets slaughtered for it because his skill doesn't seem to be in communication. It's no, it's not. In a, and, and don't get me wrong, he has a, many skills and he's excellent at what he does. And I know he's, some people are very critical of him, but yeah, in that moment, you're like, it's way too soon, it's too early. It's like calling. You know, a player world class after he's had a good start to his, his Spurs career. You know, it's and we've done that a few times before, or even slaughter Bale. Like we slaughtered Bale, got slaughtered. Um, and uh, you know, it turned out to be one of the best players we've ever seen. Anyway, so um, it or, or yeah. almost it's like if you're in the doghouse, you know, kind of with the missus or somebody, then all of a sudden you like do the dishes once, and then you're <laughs> yeah, kind of like, well, look at me, you know, like you everything, back. everything's yeah. better again, right? And it, it does seem like he was a, a bit guilty of going it a, a tad and early on that. There yeah. isn't a we, right? When there, there isn't a collective, like the Tottenham fan base and Daniel Levy and Enoch are separate things. The club belongs mm -hmm. to they they own the club, they own the trademarks, they own the rights to to commercialize it, they own the football club. But we, it's our Tottenham, mm. and we'll decide whether we're back. You can't, as the yeah. the, the head of, of of the club, declare something like that. Don't get me mm. wrong; it feels great here, and we're top of the league. Mm. But 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 it, it, we'll decide, and you'll hear it in the ground. And you're and, mm. and, and it's not something. He got a bit carried away and giddy. I think. I think yeah. he now he know he knew that he now the the appointment. Um, and and often he's made his best appointments. So this isn't this. I can't remember someone off the pod said this, but he makes his best decisions when his back's against the wall, and he's done that here. But bringing in Postecoglou and Pochettino before him, those were good decisions. Uh, but he was in a position of desperation to somebody had to get it right. Mm. Whereas in previously with, with the Mourinho thing, I think he had that lined up a while where he was in a position of comfort. Postacoglu had, Pochettino had, uh, you know, credit in the bank. And even though that was a poor season and we weren't going very far, you wouldn't have had an argument if, if Daniel Levy wanted to give Pochettino to the end of the season and help rebuild in the summer. That could be a logical thing mm -hmm. to do. Liverpool did it with Klopp in, in these off seasons and it's happened elsewhere. Arsenal stuck with Arteta for two eighth place finishes. So to stick with him at in that moment wouldn't have been as Spurs fans. I don't think we could argue with that. But he decided decided to get Jose, Jose Mourinho. It's almost like when he's in a position of strength, that's when he's as not as effective as a decision maker as he is when he has to get it right. Um, and it's look, to, he's, you've got to give him credit when he does the right things and bringing in Postecoglou and backing Paratici and giving him yeah. significant transfer funds. All of those things are things that we 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 ask for, 
Um, we had an excellent transfer window. Some players are not working out, but you you know, Basuma's stock was very, very high, and it's mm -hmm. confusing to see his form this year. But um, you can't really argue with what's gone on since Conte. Yeah. Well, since Postacoglu was 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 taken over, people wanted and um, Daniel Levy to step away from the football inside of matters. Apart from appointing Postacoglu, he's done that. He's appointed Scott yeah. Munn to um, run the football side of it. Mm. I don't know what that means, really. I don't know what he's about, Scott Munn. It, might, it feels like he's just an extension of Daniel Levy, but who knows? He, you know, he could do a good job. So it kind of everything that thing people have asked for has happened, and hopefully it will mean that the transfer uh, the no. trophies will come one day. Dave, do you agree with that? That we also, with what Flav had said originally, that Spurs fans get to decide when we have our Tottenham back. I mean, Daniel Levy doesn't get to you know, look at maybe a little few mo good months of work and then decide, you know, Spurs are back, right? You know, we get to decide that. I think you're on mute there, Dave. 100%. And I I think, you know, the Super League sort of, you know, gave gave a lot of owners, uh, you know, especially in the Premier League, a reality check. You know, they thought they could run away, do what they wanted with the football club, but fans came out, made their voices heard, and, uh, you know, they pandered down. So that shows to me, you know, they, they, they as much as they might go on and think you know, they might not, they don't need the fans and, the, you know, the people in and around, they, they, they do, they uh, do, 100%. I do think he got a bit giddy. I think, you know, Tottenham were doing well, and everything was going right, and I think he jumped on an opportunity to sort of maybe try and give a spin on the narrative around them and stuff like that, and got a bit excited with we have our Tottenham back. At the end of the day, us fans, like Flav said, we'll let you know whether we've got our Tottenham back and stuff like that. However, there has been progress this year. Where I do think Daniel Levy does need praise is Paratici for me, you know, mm. I think he's a lot of people give Ange the credit for everything that's going on uh, in terms of on the pitch and stuff like that, which 100% he deserves. But Paratici put everything in place for someone like Posta Coglu to succeed. And when all the stuff about, you know, the, the fraud in Italy and all that sort of stuff came out, everyone, most people, bar me and you, because we're the Paratici twins, Jack, you know, were, were <laughs> slandering Paratici, you know, everything that he was doing and everything else. And um, Daniel Lee but by the guy, you know, he could have easily just pandered to the crowd and sacked him and made himself look good. He didn't. You know, he stuck to his guns. He brought him in uh, as an advisor, which is absolutely genius. And he's still operating. So for me, I think he does deserve credit for that. Yeah. You know, and this will probably bring us on to the next topic. For me, he's got us back to where we sort of, you know, a good foundation in terms of on the pitch. Mm -hmm. We've got a good PR man in terms of Posta Coglu in the press and what I mean by that is he takes a lot of pressure off the club but with his mannerisms the way he speaks and stuff like that in the press rather than Conti and Jose who sort of use the press to try and get what they wanted and put a bad spin on Tottenham and stuff like that so for me it's about where does he go from here under Pochettino I'd argue he had something very similar but we were in the middle of a stadium rebuild and he prioritised that over maybe, you know, putting all the money into the squad when we could have really added a couple of players to that and really pushed on and got trophies in the bag. I think we're getting back to that point now. And I think it's just about where does he go from here? We've got more generated, we generate more revenue streams than any other club across world football. We're bringing in money in the millions. What does it, where does he yeah. go with this now? That's for me what I want to see. You know, where is he going to take this project? Is he going to back it? Is all the money that we generate going to go into the football team like he's promised? Or does he, like Flav has maybe alluded to early, or already, when things are going well, does he sit back, get comfortable, maybe pull the reins in again? So for me, it's about where we go from here. We saw you speak on that in the overlap, uh, Flav, where you were saying that Spurs find themselves with kind of a solid foundation, similar to what it was under Pochettino, but this time it could be different because Daniel Levy, when he did have that solid foundation, decided to build the stadium and, you know, in a lot of people's eyes, right, the, the funds weren't really rightly or wrongly used and, you know, the proper way to back that solid foundation. Now that the stadium is built, we're seeing, you know, all the different revenue streams. Do you think it might be different this time around where he actually can just focus on helping out the manager instead of other sort of various... I think, I mean, the, the, the evidence is there already that, that potentially it will be different. I don't know what, what mm -hmm. more people are expecting. I, I, I can't see us going out and spending £300 million net in one transfer window. I don't think that's possibly the right way to go about it either. Um, I, I think if he continues to perform or to enable a an environment where 
his employees or those below him, Langer and you know Parachi, if he's you know if he's going to return or get get more involved. I don't know what 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 that situation is. He's clear that he's involved to some degree, but also Postacoglu and give him what he wants. I I I've only seen evidence that that will be the case. I mean, who knows? Anything could happen in football. You know, we could be sold this time next year. You know, so who knows? But we, uh, you know, I, I hope so. And then you got Dragerson and Berville turning down major European superpowers yeah. to come to Tottenham. That shows you that there is some sort of cohesive plan behind There's the scenes. There's a pull, isn't there? Yeah, but you, you're you're taught yes. That, then that's the evidence. You hope that it exists, um, and you hope that there 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 are everyone is pulling in the right direction. But the evidence is there when. You see Dragerson and, and, and Berville choosing Spurs over Munich and Barcelona respectively. And that's not, that ain't like hyperbole. These are, by Munich and Barcelona were desperately frustrated by the fact that both of these players turned them down. Um, so ultimately it only matters if we challenge next year, right? Mm. Um, you know, the, the grace of this season is that he's done everything he said he was going to do post the and he's been given an environment to do that in by those above him. Mm. Um, and then next season, you want to see progress. Uh, good football isn't enough next season, is it? You want to see that there, there, there is some sort of plan to you know end this trophy drought. Mm. And um, I'm not saying if it doesn't do it, sack him or anything like that. I'm, I'm willing to be as patient as we need to be with Pastor Coglu. I can't have, I just, like people are saying that he's, it's too open, it's not working. And, and, I don't know how many of them actually want Postacoglu out at all. I don't think there isn't even... I've never met anyone who, who genuinely wants him out. Oh, it's starting. It's starting. And out is starting. Don't worry about that. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm, I don't spend... I spend very little time on Twitter now. So I, I, I'm I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm not... I'm uh, I'm not uh, privy to it all, nor, nor do I want to be. But the, uh, the, um, the situation is that... Uh, if you got him out, who the fuck would you want to bring in? Exactly. Like, what 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 are we doing if you just keep replacing managers? Yeah. Let them just see what happens. There'll always be another manager. There'll always yeah. be another season. There'll always be another bunch of players that we can buy. There'll always be another cycle. Let's just see where this one goes. We yeah. we gave Conte long enough for him to implode. That you know that that was what it was. The Jose Mourinho, you could argue that it was a bit early. Postecoglou got his fuck. Pochettino got his uh. We've got his opportunity, but in this one, just like let's say four years, barring an absolute catastrophic season where we're kind of looking, you know, wondering what, what's going on, let's just ride this train to its destination. Yeah. Mm. And who knows what might happen? What would, like you said, like what would, what would have, what would, where would Ar- Arsenal be now if they'd have listened to their fans? And I'm not saying fans <laughs> shouldn't be listened to, yeah, it's just that we don't, we aren't, we don't know everything. No one does. Football is chaos at times. And you need a lot of things to fall in their way. But what they did there, unfortunately, as you, as you said earlier, mate, it, it's frustrating how well they're doing. But look, all of it was down to having a structure and a plan that they believed in. They want they backing a horse. They backed their horse, right? Yeah, they, just, they did. Even and, when it yeah. faltered, even when it wavered, and they were all out for him, they just backed him and they, they yeah, stuck with him. Got to credit it. You got to credit it. And 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 it's and it's. It's horrible. It brings and, and part of the reason, like the frustrations. I don't care what anyone says. Massive part of that, and I wouldn't admit this to an Arsenal fan. But any frustrations we feel are compounded by the fact that, that they are yeah. currently top of the league. Yeah, yeah. that's fair. Um, that's fair. Yeah, man. So it's uh, let's just see what happens. No, um, it's been frustrating to see them in that position. It's also been frustrating to like we kind of did under the Conte season where we kept using them as an example of what we should be doing better and what we could be modeling ourselves more like. And that was getting quite sickening. And it does feel like in recent summer and, you know, with Ange that we're on the right track and we don't have to say that nearly as often, but I would still say that rings true with staying true to the manager and actually backing the horse through the end. I think the Spurs fan base at times has almost like a bit of a Watford owner kind of mentality where they just the moment that any sort of sign of something is a, a bit wrong, mm. you know, we're just quickly done with it and happy to throw it away and try it again with a new one. And it's yeah, it's entertaining, it's a, but it's it's just not actually sustainable. And it's no, also quite ridiculous on it's paper. How, it, it's, it's people that can't, I, I get it, right? But often it's people that can't, they can't deal with a disappointing result. So they have to immediately go on Twitter and just start spouting nonsense because you know, who else are they? You know, how else are they going to process this? Instead of sitting back, like my dad is seventy-two now, 
and he's mastered it. He gets disappointed. Like he wakes up in the middle of the night, he tells me, and I was like, Spurs, like after the Fulham game, it's like I woke up and I'm like, I can't couldn't stop thinking about it, girl. So like, I know he goes, Yeah, but you know, there's always next week. There's always next. And this is a man who's 72. He fucking might not see next season. Do you know what I mean? Anything can happen. So look how philosophical and stoical he's been. He might never see his first win the league. Mm. None of us move. So like it's no, that's my kind of fan. Sounds I, like a happy clapper to the core. Very good to I'll hear. Ju- I yeah, just yeah. think with anyone that's maybe asking Ange to adapt or change and stuff like that, first of all, he's not going to. When he was Celtic manager, Real Madrid came to town and he did not change and he gave them a good game for 45 minutes. Yeah. You know, the thing is with Ange Postacogno, I think this is what missing. It was the same with Klopp when he first walked into Liverpool. They have a philosophy and an identity and they want the team to stick to that no matter what. Um, and so then in future seasons, you know, when, when the going gets tough, they, they, they stick to what they're doing. They know what they're doing. They're not looking over at the sidelines, looking for the manager, please help me, this, that, and the other. They know what they need to do, and it'll see them, you know, sticking to that. We'll see them, you'll see the benefits of that next season. By him changing and chopping and changing, it allows players then to basically, well, I don't want to do that. And eventually, you know, that 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 keeps happening, and more and more players will jump on that. Well, I don't want to play this way. How many times do we hear Conte and Jose Marino? Okay, they're defensive managers, but how many times do they come out in press conferences and say, we're not asking them to sit back that deep. They're taking that upon themselves. And that's allowed because managers keep chopping and changing towards their ability and what they can do and stuff like that. With Ange Postacoglu, it's, look, this is the way I play. This is what you brought me in for. Provide me the players to go and do it. And I don't need 100 million pound players. I just need players that are hungry, good characters and want to be better, want to be at their best every single day. You know, I don't care how much it costs. You give me that guy, I'll turn him into an absolute gem. Look what he's done with some of the signings. Vicario, for instance. You know, everyone wanted David Ray, a cheapest deal you know, going for Fakari on stuff. Look at the revelation that he's been this season. And I think people just need, and look, I hate saying this word, but you know, process. But unfortunately, that's what we're in. You know, he has to stick by mm-hmm. his ideals and his philosophy so that people get he won't change. And then it's like, you're with me or you're not. And that's how he knows who will be with him, who's not, and how to wean it out and build a successful squad. So although it's frustrating, and although we live in a society where we want everything now, we have everything at the click of a button on our phones and stuff. Unfortunately, not everything's like that in life. And at some point, you do have to stick with a process. And I think that's what's happening under Ange. And I'm, I'm more than happy to back this. I'm fully behind him. The two P words that Spurs fans seem to hate, and probably rightfully so, because they get told a thousand times, are process and then patience, I think, as well as the other one that we do get kind of sick of. I believe we do have a solid foundation that Ange can build from and that Daniel Levy can build from. I really don't expect that Daniel Levy has another stadium or something that he plans on building this summer. So I do think there is going to be transfer money to spend. And you look at this last January, even the summer previously, I think Dave and I did still have some you know, kind of some criticisms of that summer window with maybe certain areas we still could have pushed a little harder. But I think that has been different of the last couple of windows now where it has been more significant investment or also just smarter investment. Like we are getting players that do seem like the right target for the right position. Doesn't just seem to be kind of some agent led sort of fiasco or something that just seems to be kind of just a sensational type of signing. It always looks smart. It looks detailed and also has usually a lot of backing of Guys like Paratici and these kind of data-led sort of uh, scouts as well. Just a lot of sort of the the research and the recruitment of Spurs has been a ton better. And it feels like we're spending a tad more uh, each passing kind of window as well. I'm not saying that like with Flav that we need to be spending $300 or that we will. But I'm not as worried that Spurs are going to try to penny pinch here and there this coming summer. I think they know for the most part who they're going after and what they will go after. And it seems like we're not missing out on our targets as much as we used to, at least in my yeah. opinion. You know, we got through most of the guys that we wanted to, from Mickey Van de Ven to Vicario to even Dragason. Yeah, I mean, the the, the 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 criticism of Daniel Levy is that, like, oh, he'll 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 let a, a little transfer fall apart over the sake of two million or five million additional, uh, you know, I'm playing over what a player's value is. You can't, you cannot... You cannot destroy a foundation from which you're looking to operate by paying clubs whatever they want for a player, even if it's overvalued, because you'll be known as a club that do that an operator that does it. Um, I'm not saying if we, there's a player out there who's perfect for a system that in some instances it's worth overpaying to get him in. Pedro Porro, for example, you would argue that he was expensive at the time with no guarantee that he was going to come good. 
But it, it, having a strong position and then you won't be taken advantage of is actually beneficial, in my opinion, over uh, you know in the long run, rather than just being shafted as seen as an easy touch. Um, and our acquisitions have been excellent. I know there's been some that have fouled to light, like um, Solomon for his injuries and Sessnion for his injury, and um, you know Basuma just hasn't. I don't know why he's a conundrum that guy. What's going on there? But yeah. just hasn't. He looks a shadow of his of the player that he played, that he was at Brighton. But generally, you're looking at it, even Richarlison this season. Done all right. You can't complain yeah. really. He's been very useful. He certainly Should has. Just, just yeah. on what you were saying there, I think you know if if if, if Paratici and Posta Coglu being here has taught us anything, it's not how much you spend; it's what you spend it on. Um, you know, um, and and for me, I I think. I also think, you know, Daniel Levy trusts Paratici's recruitment. I think he really does trust his recruitment. He wouldn't have brought him back in as advisor, uh, you know, if he didn't. And I think now when Paratici goes for deals, if Paratici said, yeah, maybe a bit overpriced, but trust me, you know, I think Daniel Levy will do that. Whereas in times gone by when it was the likes of Steve Hitchin, I can understand why he would question the price people wanted for players and not wanting to overpay it because a lot. Do, of do, do you think? Do you, do, you, do you, is, you, is it on your understanding that Prasic is pulling all the strings at Tottenham? Because my understanding is not there. Do uh, he's at the games. He's gone to. He's, he's been spotted at the stadium. Par- Which Paratici, you reckon? Yeah. Paratici was the one that. I like um, it. You know, but you know, he's the one that put the focus onto the youth team. He's the one that got a lot of them to sign their new contracts. <laughs> Mate, he's I'm the with one you. that brought in the scouting department. He changed it to a data led scouting department and stuff mm. like that. And um, you know, I also think before in times gone by, Levy had one idea as a trained accountant on finances. But I also think with Paratici coming in, he's been able to say maybe make Daniel Levy see a little bit that, okay, you're thinking it from an accountant's point of view, but as a football point of view, if you spend this now in the long run, you're actually going to make more. And I think he sort of maybe opened Daniel Levy's mind. And for me, that I, I, look, I don't have any inside sources. I never claim to or anything like that. Yeah. That's just from what I'm picking up, from what I'm reading, from what I'm being told. Like said, that. He's he been said, huge you... for everything behind the scenes. He's really... You know, put all yeah, the agree. foundations in place. He was the one that was, the, you know, bringing I bringing in like the likes of Scott Munn. So the person dealing with transfers doesn't have to deal with all the other shit that comes from the football side. He's the one that's put all the structures in place behind the scenes. One hundred percent, he is. Yeah, I mean, look, the the, the, the evidence would, would support that is Pastor Coglu claiming that you know he's uh, we're talking about Paratici and what an intelligent man he is. Uh, it was that was in the it was in January on thirty first. He said that he's mm. the article he said, uh, in the Evening Standard said he's confirmed Tottenham's worst kept secret. I mean, he's you do you want if he's has any opportunity to keep him a part of the club, then you do that because he, yeah. his his impact in, in a positive sense, his impact on Tottenham has been substantial. No, and absolutely. the minute this ban's over, just get him back in to do whatever he wants to do. Give him yeah. a ten year contract. Mm. Whatever he bloody wants, just let him operate, let him cook, as they say. Mm. Um, but the, you know, and look at you know Langer as well. I mean, I know he's it's less he's less sexy, uh, and you know, you look at what Paratici, the evidence based effect of Paratici's time at Spurs, and Langer's just started, so he hasn't had much time to work or body to work. But he would have been he would have been integral in bringing Bergwall through, mm. and we're all really hopeful about what he might do at Spurs. Mm. Looks Dave, yeah. Dave and I also have a theory that Lang has actually been brought in more also for the homegrown recruitment because we noticed that kind of that was his speciality when he was over at Aston Villa, that a lot of the guys he brought through were actually more from the lower leagues or various you know stages of the English pyramid. Or like you said, maybe these kind of random Scandinavian talents that, of course, mm-hmm. he would have better connections with other than the Don Paratici. Yeah, but kind of, I, this summer, yeah. uh, sorry, Dave, you're about to say. No, I was just going to say on the Scandinavian point, you hit home. You look at it now, it's a hotbed of talent, right? There's a lot of young talent coming out of there. And traditionally, you can pick them up cheap enough from them leagues, you know, down the years. I remember what was it when Denmark made the semi-finals all that year ago or it's the finals, whatever they made. You know, it was, again, a lot of people went out there looking and stuff like that. And I definitely think, you know, he's got, you know, he's been brought in to have one eye on that as well as the, the homegrown recruitment, like you alluded to. Some of the guys he picked up in the championship for Aston Villa and sort of brought them through and stuff like that. I just think you're spot on. And um, both will be homegrown, winning in three years. Yeah. And everybody thinks he's the future Swedish Ballon d'Or winner. Um, yeah. Looks like we could have two available with him and Kulusevski. But Flav, this summer, 
what's your priority kind of this summer, like in terms of positions, like if you were to hand Daniel Levy the list, you know, the, the holiday wish list, what would it be? What would be at the top of the list? Positions or players, whatever, you, however you want to answer that. Well, um, well, I don't think you do fix it all in one window, but that's sure. not to say we can't, you can't um, do enough to make us challengers next year. Um, like non-negotiables, yeah. Like, what's your kind of like you have non-negotiables would be, in my opinion, would be a number nine and a what well, a left winger, mm. someone so that Son isn't relied upon out there, or Richarlison isn't necessarily relied upon as number nine. I, I I'm almost convinced Ivan Tony's going to come, and I have mixed feelings about that. I don't like the way he conducts himself at all. Um, but there's no denying he's an incredible striker and he probably will end up bagging 25 for Spurs next year if it happens. I feel like that's going to happen. I don't, I've, I've had this feeling for a long time, like last season. Sorry, not last season. The first part of the season when they were talking about Tony coming back. I, I can't even remember where I hear it. It's not like I'm, I've spoken to someone in the know, but I remember hearing this rumour that, that Spurs, Ivan Tony would sign for Tottenham. And it's sort of... Just last week, it came through that Spurs have sort of a lead in the race now ahead of Arsenal, who've called their interest. Uh, that calling their interest is down to financial fair play, no doubt. But um, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, it's not like they've gone off the player. Um, so yeah, I think uh, look what would what would we have done with Harry Kane in the, as number nine this season? It would have been frightening. Um, and Richarlison's done an incredible job, long-standing critic of Richarlison. Uh, probably unfairly, but I've I've made my bed and and I'm just going to lie in it now. Um, I think we could upgrade him, mm. but I also did a we did a podcast called the Lab, which is a sort of sister podcast to the Fighting Cock. It's a little bit more sensible than the Fighting Cock. And statistically, I had this guy on. We were talking about statistics and stuff, and he was talking like in terms of I can't remember what it was. It was like shot actions. He's comp. Oh, no, shot creating actions. Or yeah, something. like chances created. That that. A fancy yeah. way of measuring chances created. It yeah. Made it made a lot of, but 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 no, his shots. His shots on goal. So his efforts on goal were, mm. were comparable to Haaland. Like it was something like that. Shows you the stats of bollocks, right? But but um, <laughs> yeah, they are quite interesting. You can take a lot from them. To be fair. Anyway, look. So what I'm saying, my long winded, garbled way of saying this is, I think I'm probably underrating how good Richarlison is. But I still think a number nine would be the would be a solution that we'd need we, we, something we need a solution for obviously fullbacks massive issue if Poro and a doggy's out you can mm. probably deal with one like Poro is there and have Davies you might be able to deal with that but another fullback to come in a lot of it depends on whether we're not going to get Champions League football mm. we'll probably get Europa League football but if we do get Champions League football then there are going to be games there to play and if we get not down to Europa League you still got to prepare for that as well. Yeah. Mm. The, the, the difficulty this season, you saw him with Dragerson, he's, he's come from playing regular football for Genoa, being their main guy, to come to Spurs and not playing for six yeah. weeks. And th so he comes in against um, Fulham. And you know, I thought he did okay, actually, but he looked a little bit like... I mean, it was the difference between Van der Ven, who's now a seasoned Premier League player, and Dragerson, who's... You know, not up to speed and playing in Genoa and at a, at a level that's significantly lower in in mm. Italy. You know, you can't blame him for a kind of a, a difficult position to uh, um, a difficult debut, full debut. But it's it's all about how many games you can play and how you can develop the squad, and you can do that with European football. So, if you how much you're going to spend on backup fullbacks if you're only playing domestic football that's in fair. the season? Probably not a lot. You stick with what you got, but he feels like, yeah, we need to we need to do something there. So I would say at least one fullback, left wing, number nine, and if Pesuma doesn't improve towards the end of the season, you probably have to look at number six as well. I think a lot of people would agree with those boxes. Mm -hmm. And as a Yank, I'm actually required always to you know use stats uh, in order to back myself in any situation. But Good. I don't need to here. Um, I'm kind of in agreement with you. I think we do need another goal scorer of some kind. I love Richarlison. I've actually been sadly a big defender of his, maybe comparison to you uh, over this over this course of time. And I think he's shown to be very useful as somebody who can offer something different to kind of Sonny, Werner, whichever sort of kind of speedy, pacey striker through the middle when it is going to be mm. everybody and their mother behind the ball defending deep in a low block you do need somebody in that box somebody who can 
kind of occupy those center backs, make them think about something else and be that physical presence in there when you do need to start just kind of whipping a ball into the penalty area and see if a guy can rise up and meet it. And he's done that on a few occasions so far this season that has helped us win games, but we can't just have one of them. And also still, as much as I have defended for Charleston, is he really that clinical? No, like he has very streakiness kind of to him where he will miss a chance or two and be nicer to have somebody who I'd say could actually bury some of those chances more often that maybe Richarlison has missed, despite Richarlison mm-hmm. still being, I think, the second highest contributor so far this season. But I agree with that on, on the winger and, and a striker. But Dave, where do you lean kind of on your priorities as well? What would you add to that? Well, look, everyone knows, you know, and I'm glad Flav, Flav touched on it. I, I, I don't feel as deluded anymore. Imagine where it'd be without Harry Kane. So I think, you know, a striker for me is a must. Don't get me wrong. You know, I like Richarlison. When I look at it, he's the only other player outside Son in double figures. So he's not having as catastrophe a season as most people make out. But for me, I also think there's legitimacy to having two strikers at Tottenham Hotspur. So I think you bring someone else in to compete with Richarlison. For me, you know, I think, uh, you know, Son, Son is a left winger. He's played there all his life. I, I think, you know, when he goes up front, don't get me wrong, he's done a job. He's ice cold in front of goals. But teams that play five across the back, we can't get him into the game. We just can't. He gets crowded out. And for me, Son is best off the left wing. You know, we need him as a chief creator. And where, you know, I know a lot of people say, well, he scored a lot more up front than he has off the left wing. And that's because I told you all, when Harry Kane goes, he won't have anyone to supply him with them chances. Harry Kane, the ball used to be popped into him, take it down, Son spins him behind straight over the top. Richardson can't do that. So in order to get the best out of Son back off the left again, you do need maybe another option up front or Madison needs to come to the party and stop showboating and stuff like that. Um, but for me, I definitely think fullback, um, I think is definitely needed. Davies has to go. He's big Fulham, Crystal Palace this year, he played left back. He can't do what Ange needs them to do in that role. He has to go. So I think I need another left back. Centre back, I'd just bring Ashley Phillips through next season, to be brutally honest with you. I'd look into bringing another number six to really challenge Basuma. I think that's what Basuma lacks. Yeah. I think he he if, you know, he knows he's not going to be dropped if he's fit. Skip ain't coming in ahead of him, neither is Hoiberg. So I think that's where you see maybe the complacency in him. I think if you bring someone and put him on his toes, I think you'll see a much better player there personally. And then a striker, and I would like another winger. Um, I just want a winger that can cross a ball. I wouldn't be averse to bringing in that young guy, Ebiselli from Udinese, the Irish guy, and move Porro out to right wing and use, you know, his best assets, which is spraying passes around, crosses, bringing a different mm. variety of chances that maybe the wingers we currently don't have. So for me, I think three or four players in the right positions could really kick us on um, next season. Definitely agree with a lot of that. And um, we want to be conscious of your time, Flav. I also kind of have to be there somewhere sometime Mm -hmm. soon. So we're just going to kind of cool things down with just kind of a few questions just quickly from people in the chat here. And then if you needed to plug anything as well. Um, Tekken, by the way, just wanted to say thank you for kind of all the viewings kind of over the years uh, and what you kind of have done in the past is kind of sort of a, he said, kind of one of the original kind of podcast people in the Spurs community. And he said he even popped out his shoulder uh, watching the the Man City game uh, when Llorente had scored uh, in the final minutes. And then also uh, mm. someone is asking you, uh, which midfielder should we go for in the summer or is Hoiberg the answer? That's what someone would like to ask you. I, I, I defend Hoiberg because I think at times when, or many times when he's come off the bench to steady the ship, he's he's been good. Yeah. Um, he's obviously wanted to move away because he realized he wasn't going to be, you know, in the first team. But what a professional. And uh, what someone who, who just doesn't, who, who, you know, the, Absolutely. It, 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 the, the, there'd be no world where he would down tools or not play to the best of his ability and give everything, right? And that's that should be, regardless of a player's skill, how much a player gives when they put the show on should be the sp- starting point for how highly they're rated, right? He's, all players have their limitations, but how do they apply themselves? Are they passionate about what they're doing when they're playing for Spurs? And we've had many players that are better technically than, than than Hoybier, who have not loved the club or not at least True. displayed a passion that that Hoybier shows uh, and and get more love for it. Yeah. So, um, do you think I, he's the most divisive <laughs> player ever, like to play at Spurs? I, I think he is. Uh, I, well, well, well most um, yeah. people love him, or, or yeah, they, it's neither. It's one or the other. It's never in the middle. It feels like they either yeah. love him, worship him, or they hate him. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I am in the middle, and I don't worship him or <laughs> hate him, but the I get it. I, he does polarize. Um, but yes, no, he, he he does need. He's gonna. You'd imagine there's a transfer fee that we could get for him. 
um 20 million maybe 25 Probably. do you reckon that feels about right and yeah. you know thinking like joe roden as well there's a the 20 million pound fee, price on his head now coming from, from from leeds who look like they're coming up to the premier league again imagine that 20 million pound for joe roden that's <laughs> insane like he's been sensational for them this yeah. season so they're going to have to pay, right? So, you True. know, you're already building through just the sale of these two players, a nice little nest egg. That's a £40 million player that you can supplement our midfield. Um, I'm talking around this because I, do you know what? I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. You don't I, need to name them Connor, midfielder, but it sounds like Hoy Berg, you think, is going to be out the door and we're going to have to replace just there's him. Just value, there's value yeah. there. I mean, if you said to me, sell Roden and you sell Roden and. Um, Sorry, my bad. Where am I going? So, so Roden and Hoybier for 40 million and bring in Conor Gallagher for 40 million. You'd probably do that. Yeah. In a way, How do you feel about see, him? You could see Spurs. Uh, Connor, I could see why Ange likes him. I just think there's better out there, uh, to yeah. be honest. For what he sees in Conor Gallagher, I think there's better players than Conor Gallagher. But I do understand why he likes Conor Gallagher. Don't get me wrong. You can see what he does. Kind of, especially he scores goals. Like, to be fair to the guy, he ends up scoring <laughs> goals, late runs into the box. But yeah, I'm not so keen on. Been good on this year. Would, would be know. another man bun in the team though. We only have one man bun in the team. I think yeah, it's always good it. to have two just in case. But At Dave, least. Dave doesn't love him as much. As they look, this man bun trend has to stop first of all. <laughs> um, they put more time into the hair than what my missus does. Um, but look, when, when, when it comes to Connor Gallagher. Look, I can understand why Ange likes him. He's mobile. He's a lot of energy. He gets around. He's good defensively and good going forward. I just feel good, like in, there is a lot of good. I just feel like in the big moments, I don't think he'll step up. For instance, cup final for Chelsea, missed a couple of sitters, didn't have the greatest of games. You know, for England at times, hasn't been the best. And I just feel like, you know, against, against the teams where you're expecting him to form, he's good. I think when the big, real big moments come around, he's not a guy I would depend on. And that's why I'm a bit dubious on it. Hmm. And mm. uh, last but not least, uh, Mark would like to ask before we let you go here, Flav, uh, what it was like starring in the movie The Gentleman. Uh, well, I suppose I look like someone in there, do I? Is that another one? Another that, look like... I, I don't understand the reference. You haven't seen well, it. I watched The Gentleman. Uh, I didn't see you in it, but I think there think... is a guy in it that looks like you. I don't think he does look like me, but I, he's not. A, he's a quite handsome guy. He's the guy from. Um, have you ever seen Green Street, Jack? He's in Maybe. Sons of Anarchy. Yes, the lead the lead character in Sons of Anarchy plays a gangster in The Gentleman. Okay, and uh, this, this 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 gentleman this gentleman. It's like there's. I don't know if you've seen on Twitter. There's a long running joke that's been going on for what feels like decades now, uh, where anybody sees anybody who looks like me, and there seems to be millions out there. Some of them I can't argue with. Like, there was a couple. I'm like, is that me? Like, there was a geezer in... Um, I can't... If the, there's a geezer... There's a bloke who runs... A, it's called the James and Fluff Community Page. He's a big fan of the, the pod uh -huh. I do with Jim. And he, he, he's made a collage of all these. There's like there's, like, there's literally about 300. And there's, there's one of Mike Skinner uh, of the streets... And in the back, there's a keyboardist, and it is me. It's, it's, it's so much me that I was looking at it and going, was, would I th was I there? Like, I've done a lot of things in my life where I could, I've been in places and I can't remember why I was there or what was multiple how personality. I, how I got there through bad decisions that I'd made. But to, I was like, that's that. And I sent it to my mum, and she's like, oh, that's really good. You spent some time with Mike Skinner. I was like, that's not me. Anyway. Um, yeah, there's another one. You're, you're <laughs> there, you, there you go, Mark. There you go. Just quickly, Flav, before we let you, uh, you know, plug plug a couple of your podcasts. There's two quick questions there um, that I just I just want to throw in as well. Paul O'Connor says, "What do you guys think of Keeley being back up to bring it uh, to Vicario next season?" I'll I'll tailor that. Is there anyone from the under twenty ones that you would like to see given the opportunity next season? Uh, well, uh, Jamie Donnelly's been uh, again. We do the lab podcast. And, He's terrific. Yeah, th there's a lot of hype around him. Uh, I don't know if you know a guy called Ben Bowman, who he spends a lot of time watching the women's mm. football, the under 21s. He's got big TikTok. Anyway, um, he he's been banging that Jamie Donnelly drum. Um, Ashley Phillips is having a good loan, so you know, but it looks like we've been linked with Bremner today. I don't know if you if you saw that mm. or Bremer, what his name is. Yeah, Gleason Bremer, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to see them incorporated more, but I'm not obsessed by by bringing players through. I'd rather buy a ready-made player than than mm. insist on developing a youth player. I know that wouldn't. That's not going to fit with Daniel Levy's plans. Otherwise, why invest huge amounts of money in there? Mm. But um, I don't know. I've never been obsessed with bringing youth players in. I 
Like if they're good know. enough, they should play. If they're not good enough, then fucking sell them. Mm. Look, uh, you know, yeah. Uh, look, I, I think, I think, I, I would like to see a couple of young kids come through because I do think, you know, kids that come through to care for the club more and they maybe keep others honest around them. I think it's always good to have one or two in the dress room for sure. But yeah. last question uh, from 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 the members here, Flav James yep. Flower, would you uh, take Timo Werner on a permanent in the summer? I think it's a no-brainer for seventeen million euros. That's the fee, is it, or million pounds? Yeah. Uh, just in in six months, if he plays regular football, he's gonna be worth more than that. So, just in a business perspective, you keep him in there. Mm. I don't think he's done. He's done. I think he's had six, seven out of ten performances this season. Um, you know, he, he's bagged a couple of goals, got three assists. I think like he's he's done a good job. Like I don't know what the, where the word hate comes from, but um. It makes logical sense to bring him in. I don't think you bring him in and he's the answer to our left wing position. Yeah. But I bring him as a member of the squad. He's a. Are you, did one of you hate him or? No, no, we turbo Timo. No, uh, you are good. I, 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 I mean, I, I like Timo because I watch a lot of Bundesliga. But Dave, I think originally wasn't so keen on the signing. And he's then is, on me. But yeah, Dave, on is, you, Dave is just but, wants to do Werner on the dance floor every game. Yeah. Much, so I mean, look, cool. He cannot be the solution to the left wing problem if yeah. we want to go and achieve. But as a member of the squad of significant quality, bearing in mind he's achieved more than our entire club has in 33 decades in winning the Champions League. You know, it's all well and good Spurs fans going, well, no, no, he's not good enough. He's, he's won the Champions League. We've never done that. It's like... I don't know. Maybe I'm being. Do a little you know bit... what? Just quickly for me, you know, uh, I just I don't think he's clinical enough for what we need. However, he's starting to, you know, may, maybe prove me wrong a little bit with some of his performances and stuff like that. So I I, I wait to see what he does between now and the end of the season, yeah. and I'll take it from there. You know, it's fair, only fair. I, I I'm not one of them. I have my preconceived opinion on a player, and I won't change it. I will if he if if, if he proves me wrong. Yeah. But look, Flav. I want to say thank you very much for your time this afternoon. You, it really no, means a lot you. giving up your time to myself thank and Jack. Uh, we really do enjoy having you on here and you know chatting, chatting football. And well, I may always talk them with you. But um, you know, where where can people find you? I feel embarrassed asking you this because everyone well, knows who you are. But <laughs> no, you know, just, just there's always one. I'm very grateful. Thank you. I'm very grateful. Um, I, well, I'll just say, could you listen to the Lab Podcast, a new podcast that I've set up? Um, that's been going for about ten weeks. And if you want a break from Tottenham Hotspur, then listen to Lads Anonymous Pod which is a podcast about everything outside of football, really. Um, I do with my good mate. Best brilliant. Mate. Oh, nice one, mate. Thank you. No, yeah, I love it. It's brilliant. He, he's, he keeps me entertained, you know. That's the, that's the plan. That's the plan. When, you, when, you, when, you, when you're sick of listening to stuff about Tottenham and you don't yeah. want to listen to talk sport and all that crap anymore, it's nice to uh, you know have something completely different. I'll put the lab in here now in the chat so people get mm -hmm. over to that. And then I'm also going to put in uh, Lads Anonymous, which is a great Legends. podcast. Well, thank Cheers, you, everybody, boys. for enjoying this with us. Thank you to Flav, everybody, for taking the time out of his day. Please thank him in the chat. And uh, anybody else who's watching this back and maybe realized that they could have watched it early, feel free to become a member. Check out all of the lovely content that's coming out from ourselves as well as the Fighting Cock podcast and everything else out there in the Spurs community. I think we'll leave you there, though, everybody. Come on, you Spurs. In the Big Ant, we trust. We never stop. See ya. See you all soon. Everywhere we go, we're